This is another iRaw podcast. And I think systematic problems also go to the heart of need for legislative change. And that is, um, you know, not in the best interest of industry. Welcome back to The Animal Turn. Today I speak to Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan, who is a senior lecturer in social policy at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Siobhan has interests in animal welfare policy and environmental ethics, and is also the author of three books, one of which we'll speak a bit about today called Animals, Equality and Democracy. Siobhan is very well known for her podcast, Knowing Animals, and is also the founder of the IRO Network, which The Animal Turn is on. I was extremely excited when Siobhan agreed to be interviewed by me today and also very thankful to her for her patience in setting up this interview. For some reason, our internet connection and sound were just not working, but luckily we figured it out and here we are. In terms of content, we're going to be focusing on a set of laws that have seemed to have migrated from the US to other countries with the express purpose of protecting agricultural industries and in many ways working against the efforts of animal rights activists. These are, of course, ag-gag laws. Siobhan speaks a bit about them, in particular how they have manifested in Australia. She also flags some of the questions around visibility and what this means for creating new legislation and thinking about animal welfare law. I hope you enjoy the episode. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining me. It's really a thrill and a wonder to have you in on my first season ever as a podcaster dealing with animal animals issues and animal studies scholarship. Um I always give people that I'm interviewing right at the beginning of the episode an opportunity to maybe say a bit about yourselves and how you came to become an animal studies scholar. Uh, Sure, wonderful. So let me start by uh, commending you on this uh, podcast series. It's just so wonderful to have it up and running. And I'm really happy uh, to be invited to be a guest on your show. So in my case, what happened was I took a little while to get my degree in order. So I did a few other different things in life, such as I went overseas as an exchange student and I enrolled in my first degree as psychology and didn't really like it and kind of dropped out. So by the time I was back at uni doing my degree, I was already, you know, kind of a young adult and I was living away from home and working and all the rest of it. And I already had an interest in animal issues. So I was vegetarian and then vegan and I was actively attending animal rights type meetings. I was involved uh, with Animal Liberation New South Wales. And so for me, I did a traditional... I guess degree, it was a Bachelor of Arts with a major in politics. And then when it got to honours year, which is a little bit of an unusual year, it's an Australian phenomenon that that some of your listeners might might not be familiar with, but the kind of the top students get the opportunity to go into this particular year where they have the opportunity in one year to write a 20,000 word minor dissertation Mm -hmm. on any topic of their interest. And so I, when I was told, you know, I could write on anything that I wanted to write about, whatever interests you most, I thought, oh, well, you know, what interests me most is animal issues. So I did my minor dissertation on animal issues and it was quite challenging because in those days there was not a lot of political scholarship on animal animal stuff. But anyway, Mm. I did it and it went uh, well. And then I uh, had a bit of a break and I went and worked for a small animal charity and I worked there for about a year and a half and it was a very kind of, um, you know, it was a very, very small operation, not many staff and they did a lot of cat rescue and things like that but also did some campaign work and that kind of um, then got me involved in the national kind of scene of animal protection in Australia. And so then when I went back to uni to write my PhD, it just seemed natural to write on animal issues and that was what I knew and that's what I was passionate about. So that's what I did and um, and that went well also and that was kind of, I guess, the beginning of it. And then as soon as, you know, you start your PhD, then, of course, you start publishing and, yeah, the rest, as they say, is history. 
And um, for anyone who's uh, listening to this podcast, I think they probably already know who you are because you yourself are something of a prolific podcaster, uh, knowing animals. How did how did that get started? Uh, well, uh, with knowing animals, what happened was I really enjoy podcasts. I love listening to audio. I'm not super keen on sitting down and reading so much. I like to move around, but I also like hearing stories. And in particular, I like comedy, but I like learning and all that kind of stuff. So I was always an audio person. So I got very into podcasts very quickly when they first emerged. And it was, you know, listening to podcasts was a big part of my life. And so I thought, you know, I want to be part of this. I want to make my own podcast. I want to contribute to this really fascinating phenomenon where, you know, we can have all these different people approaching all these issues, you know, in any way they like, only uh, limited by their own imagination. Mm. So in my case, I thought, well, what can I contribute to the world of podcasting? And I thought, look, the thing that I know is animal protection, particularly animal protection scholarships, animal studies. And so I just developed um, the kind of format that I use in Knowing Animals, which is to uh, f- focus it around a particular publication. And so for me, what that means is that I can get guests back multiple times. And the mm. idea was kind of, if we talk about this particular publication, then perhaps people can read it in accompanying the podcast, or it can be a background to help you understand the publication a little bit better. I don't know if it's really become that so much. I don't know. I don't have a lot of evidence that people see the episode appear in their podcast feed and quickly race off and read the journal article. (laughs) But it has become an interesting way to talk about animal protection issues. And then I end it with what I call the five quick questions, which is I ask everyone the same series of questions at the end. And I think that gives it just a little bit of a structure, like a radio program. Mm -hmm. And I just really enjoy you know, I like ideas and I like meeting people and I like discussing things and I like podcasts. So it's all just come together wonderfully. The bit that I don't like so much is um, things to do with sound engineering and technology. Well, yeah, <laughs> we, I mean, listeners might, listeners won't know that it just took us 40 minutes to get this episode going because of technical difficulties. Um and you've also just recently, uh, with your podcast, you've also recently started the iRaw Network. That that was your doing, right? Yeah. So what I noticed was that a lot of the podcasts I listen to are part of networks. And to me, it just makes great sense that if everyone is, um, you know, one of the best ways to get kind of new listeners to your podcast is to get someone on who's already on a podcast and then, you know, podcast listeners, you know, you don't have to choose one podcast. You can have a hundred podcasts that you like. Mm. And so podcast listeners, I think, will follow individuals that they like between podcasts. And so I thought if we had a network of people making podcasts with a focus on animal issues, then we will, in a sense, be supporting each other. We'll be advertising each other every time. We'll be we'll be able to work together and yeah it'll just be beneficial to everyone so I was really lucky to get a um a grant from animals and society and um I'll beg your pardon at culture and animals or it might be animals and culture and uh they gave me some money to set up this podcasting network and I've been really pleased with how it's gone Now, I have Mm. to say we're always looking for new members. So if you're listening to this and you do make a podcast and you'd like to join, there's no cost. It's just for benefit for you to to get listeners and to be part of something where we're all sharing and, and basically letting the listening public know that if you like animal issues and you like podcasts, there's a whole suite of podcasts available to you. Just click on the iRaw website. Yeah, it's an incredible website. Uh, the layout itself, uh, the website is quite like beautiful and pleasing to look at. Um, and then the content that, you know, it varies from everything from activists speaking to, you know, tips on cooking to scholarship. Uh, it's really a, a fantastic group of podcasts. So I don't know if I, I would have found all of those different um, those different podcasts or episodes uh, by myself but now having this network available it's really an awesome resource so thank you so much for doing that oh 
my pleasure and I have to give a shout out to Anthony Terry. He's a long time animal advocate, New Ze originally from uh, New Zealand and I have to say that he designed that website and it was really meant a lot to me to have an animal person do it mm. and he put a lot of work into it so, so shout out to him. Yeah, and he's just a really nice guy as well <laughs> um, with all my like random emails and um, questions about how to do things. He's He's been lovely. So uh, let's, today we're focusing on a pretty important set of laws. We've, and so far in season one, we've spoken about a whole bunch of different types of legal concepts, things like personhood or legal subjects. But today we're speaking about ag gag laws which have pretty real world consequences i mean all of these legal concepts have pretty real world con uh, consequences but ag gag laws are pretty particular uh, in that they started in the u.s if i'm not mistaken is that is that correct i think that's fair to say and perhaps you could give us a quick overview of what an ag an ag gag law is yeah, so uh, look, I, I should start by saying uh, for the benefit of your listeners that I'm not a legal scholar and I've not been trained as a legal scholar. I'm a political scientist um, and I specialise in animal welfare policy, so I'm a public policy scholar really, mm -hmm. which is a subfield of politics. But the kind of animal studies research I've done traditionally and certainly going back to the time of my PhD has included some kind of focus on statute law or what you might call, again, public policy. And I've had this ongoing interest with this phenomenon, which is this notion that we live in a liberal democracy. One of the things that's implied by that kind of life is that citizens will be engaged in policy making. So the kind of laws we have, the kind of society we live in, what's allowed, what's not, is informed by the citizenship. And, mm -hmm. of course, we don't have a direct democracy. We don't go and sit in the demos and debate all day long while our slaves, you know, prepare our, our meals for us. But we do have a representative democracy and we make decisions about who to vote for based on their values, what they believe, and the kinds of legal frameworks they're going to deliver to us. But in the case of non-human animals, we have this very, very uh, unsatisfactory, in my view, situation from a liberal democratic perspective, which is that we have got millions, if not billions of animals that we purposely breed who are living lives that are completely invisible to us. We cannot see them. We cannot interact with them. Now, some critics of my work uh, say, oh, you know, you paint this picture of animals are all invisible. And, and I, I do take that criticism on board. I do acknowledge that certainly there are a lot of animals living in cities, living, you know, urban lifestyles who aren't restrained, etc. But I'm talking about animals that we do breed and we do restrain and mm -hmm. overwhelmingly that's in the agricultural sector. So we have all these animals and then at the same time we also have these things called animal welfare laws and animal welfare laws stipulate the kind of uh, access to exercise animals have, uh, how often they need to be fed, what, what provisions of water, veterinary care, restraints, what kind of mutilations or surgeries can be performed on their bodies but we're not ever actually able to see the animals that are subject to these laws. So we end up mm -hmm. with this puzzle. We live in a democracy. Animal welfare laws are supposed to represent the kind of values that, that the community holds, yet we're not actually able to ever look at the subject of these animals. And so, of course, animal activists have known for a long time that we've got animals living in factory farms who are living in conditions that perhaps don't reflect community values. And so from at least the kind of late 70s, early 80s in Australia, but also perhaps slightly later in the US, animal advocates started entering these facilities illegally, so committing trespass, mm -hmm. and recording what they see, usually using some kind of photographic evidence, with the aim of making the community aware of what's happening inside these otherwise socially invisible spaces. 
And it has been a very effective technique, I have to say. So things mm. like um, in Australia, it's very hard to walk into a supermarket and find an egg that has been laid by a hen that lives in a battery cage. And, of course, that is nothing to do with anything that the people who grow eggs have done. They've got no interest in making people aware of what a battery cage looks like and what it's like for a bird to live inside a battery so. cage, et cetera. That's the work of the activists. But over time, in response to this trend, what's happened is that the powers that be have begun to make it more and more difficult for activists to undertake this work. And it is a really interesting uh, phenomenon and these laws that have been created in response to this activity are often referred to as ag-gag. And one of the reasons I say it's really interesting is that trespass has always been illegal and indeed the animal activists who um, commit trespass know it's illegal and I've argued previously in other publications that when, when they commit that trespass um, in a way that is non-violent and they they do it in a way that's aimed at policy change and also at sharing information with the community, we might say that it's consistent with the best best traditions of civil disobedience. Mm -hmm. Um, But, of course, for the people who who, um, benefit from factory farming and that kind of thing, this is not a good development. So in the United States, a series of laws started to develop kind of from about the 80s and then quickly sped up that took that which was already illegal and in a sense made it double illegal. So it just made it even more difficult for activists to undertake this work of making this information available to the community. So and that's that's a really lovely, I think, overview of, of what it is we're speaking about and it cuts to the heart of, of the ag-gag laws. And when you speak about the type of visibility and the efficacy of these videos, I, I think you'd be hard-pressed to find uh, any listeners that haven't seen videos pop up on their Facebook feeds or in, in any other social media that they use of animals you know, in pretty hard conditions. Now, those videos, I think it's probably fair to say, are the work of animal rights activists, like you rightfully, um, like you you mentioned. Uh, and has there been any success, before we get into what that double severity is of the ag-gag laws themselves, has there been any success in closing down a plant or severely curtailing or changing the behaviour of any of these agricultural places? I think we can point to a range of successes. So, of course, social change is a very, very slow process and that's one of Mm -hmm. the reasons why, you know, animal advocates can find themselves feeling disheartened and why we have concepts such as burnout, et cetera. But I think we can point to, I think, both some direct and perhaps more abstract uh, successes. So, of course, I'm most familiar with the Australian context. And I have to say, in Australia, we pioneered something called open rescue. And that's a way of going into a factory farm that isn't done in a kind of a balaclava type way. So the Australian tradition, which is the one that I'm most familiar with and the one that I write about predominantly, is a peaceful tradition. People go in openly. They, the people who trespass are often the ones that call the police. They don't cover their face and they accept the consequence and they take the view that this is such a moral affront that I'm prepared to risk my own liberty and perhaps safety to make people aware of how these animals are suffering and I stand with the animals. So, Mm -hmm. for example, in New South Wales, this is some time ago now, quite a few decades ago, there was quite a big action at a piggery where pigs were um, being tethered. So this is sows that would normally be in what we call a sow stall. They were being tethered and a group of activists, including Peter Singer, Uh, tethered themselves to the South Store and, of course, called the media and all the rest of it. Now, the result of that was actually that the tethering of South was prohibited in New South Wales. But in order to uh, kind of be um, 
sincere to to what happened. What I have to add is that at the time they prohibited it, only a couple of farms were still tethering. So it was almost an obsolete activity. So Mm -hmm. it becomes easier to do these things when activities are not economically, um, you know, enriching or or, um, I don't want to say viable, but they're not hugely profitable. Um, Okay. There are alternatives. There are alternatives and also Mm -hmm. when not too many people are benefiting from it. Um, We had a very big expose in Australia about live animal exports um, from Australia to Indonesia and the way in which Australian uh, cattle originating in Australia were being slaughtered and that resulted in a temporary ban on live animal exports into that market and resulted in a lot of regulatory changes. Now, we can debate how effective those regulatory changes really have been, but there's Mm -hmm. no doubt that it certainly got the community's attention. And more recently, there have been uh, exposés on television into greyhound racing in Australia and um, undercover footage, which would have required trespass, was obtained of the greyhounds being blooded, which means that they were being trained uh, with live animals uh, as bait. And that has had fairly significant and widespread consequences. Some people have been charged with animal cruelty. I think perhaps even one person might be serving a jail term as a result. Um, Greyhound racing was temporarily banned in New South Wales, but that was overturned. It has been banned in other parts of Australia. So that that was quite effective. But again, greyhound racing is not a hugely lucrative uh, economic activity. You know, um, certainly there's no suggestion that the Melbourne Cup, which is a very, very uh, lucrative horse race, is susceptible to such intervention. So there has been some success, but it's slow. Okay. And... You know, these are some real changes for, for the animals involved and certainly for the industries involved. Uh, and it's it's great to hear, I think, that there are people out there that are brave enough to go and to record these instances. And as you're talking, it, it makes me think of whistleblowers. So the idea of trespassing, uh, you know, I think, so I'm from, you know, I'm from South Africa. I'm from a country in which civil disobedience was a very important part of our of our history and where we are today. And it involved breaking laws. It involved trespassing. It involved, you know, several measures to whistleblow what were really uh, abhorrent practices. So how does the idea of whistleblowing uh, and trespassing, how do they come into connection or conflict with one another is there any sort of protection for these you know animal rights activists as whistleblowers are they thought of as whistleblowers or respected in that way yeah it's a that's a really interesting issue and um and I I think it really does point to some of the complexities of what we're dealing with in this case so one of the problems that I think animals face in Australia and other similar countries is the profound nature of their invisibility. And so when it comes to something like factory farming, you know, you can have a shed with, you know, maybe 50,000 birds in it and Mm -hmm. only one or two people will ever enter that, that shed and Anyone who does go into the shed has a direct pecuniary interest in that animal living that way. And so it's not an industry where you do get a lot of whistleblowers. Now, that said, a while ago, and this is quite a while ago now, Animal Liberation New South Wales did run a whole lot of ads in rural newspapers with this asking for whistleblowers to come forward and they had a one you know free number that you could call they guaranteed anonymity and one one of the issues that they identified was that in rural communities neighbors rely on each other they you need to have good relationships with your um 
neighbours because, of course, people are susceptible to bushfires and Mm -hmm. floods and all kinds of calamities and you just, you have to work as a community. And so then it's very difficult, for example, to call something like the RSPCA, which is our very traditional animal law enforcement agency, um, because they want it all on the record and then, you know, the last thing you want is, you know, RSPCA inspectors turning up and telling you that, you know, your neighbours dobbed you in and blah. So Mm. they were doing this kind of work of trying to mediate. And one of the things that they found was that where you would get a a whistleblower around um, factory farming was the people who did the transport. So the transport people, when they de-stock, would would see the animals and be shocked. And perhaps also around um, handymen, you know, if you had broken glass or if the glazier came or whatever else. In the case of animal Um, activists, what they do is they actually go in and have a look at the facility. So they're not waiting to hear And this is one of the interesting things about it. They know that the animals are going to be in a bad condition because simply trying to live in a metal cage with three other birds is an awful life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there isn't a lot of whistleblowing kind of interaction. And, no, I have to say typically the animal activists who trespass aren't seen as whistleblowers. But that said, they have typically in Australia, faced very, very modest um, penalty. So typically the magistrate will give a very low fine, if anything. We recently had something occur in uh, the state of Victoria, in the city of Melbourne, where animal activists uh, really did cause a major disruption on the streets during um, peak hour when people are trying to get home from work. And the activists would would find something like a hundred dollars each, and they could give that to their favourite animal charity. So it's it, wow. they haven't been getting really big, serious um, penalties. That does sound like a very different situation to maybe you know some of the language that's coming out of US uh, ag gag laws seem to be quite a bit more serious. Um, uh, but just to to backtrack a thought I I had now when you were speaking about whistleblowers. I imagine rural communities, it's difficult, but also, you know, I don't know if it's similar in Australia, but in the North American context, the amount of migrant labor that's required to keep, you know, animal agriculture functioning. And I think this is coming to light quite a bit at the moment with COVID-19, where several plants or facilities have been shut down, one being JBS, another Cargill, and all of a sudden, you know, people are saying, how have people been working in these facilities in such poor conditions? And I think it's starting to highlight a number of these kind of social tensions between people, that this isn't just a, a place in which is bad for animals, but it tends to also be a place that humans are mistreated in as well. Mm. Um, per- perhaps we can shift now to talking about uh, ag-gag laws themselves. So you mentioned earlier that they have, they're like doubly bad. So to trespass is already against the law, but ag-gag laws themselves are more severe. How how did these come about and, and how do they make it more severe? How can something be even more illegal? Yeah, so... I have to say, you know, the context in which animal activists are getting these rather modest fines, not to say it's not stressful having to face a magistrate. I think it is stress. It mm. is sincerely stressful for those individuals. But I think that that's fair to say that that's outside this ag-gag infrastructure. So in Australia, ag-gag really um, started coming about in kind of the – around, say, 2015, 2016. So it's still fairly new and it's still evolving and it's still being rolled out across the country. And in Australia, we have a federal political system, so a lot of these laws are state by state, but also the federal government has started getting itself involved. So I think it's fair to say that in Australia it's probably going to get more difficult for animal activists um, mm-hmm. hopefully it won't become as difficult as it has been in the US, although the US does have very good freedom of expression laws that we don't have in Australia. 
But there are a couple of things that have been happening in Australia that I think uh, 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 kind of speak to this issue of how can you make it more difficult when we already know it's illegal. So one of the things is to increase fines for trespass and to make it non-discretionary for the magistrate. So to, to put in place minimum fines. The other thing that's happened that has been very problematic for animal activists is introduction of laws that make it a requirement that any evidence of animal mistreatment or animal welfare concerns or compromises has to be surrendered to the police within a very short period of time, typically 24 hours. Oh, wow. What that does is that that forecloses the potential to establish a systematic um, pattern of behaviour. And this works in the favour of the animal industrial complex because one of the tried and tested um, methods of trying to uh, respond to people who are concerned about animal welfare issues is to say, look, that thing that you see there, that particular battery cage, that particular south store, that particular shed, that particular farm, that's an anomaly. And we have to find the people who are doing the wrong thing, get rid of them, but you can trust overall that the industry is fine, we have animal welfare laws and most people abide by them. And so one of the things that uh, animal activists like to do in order to build a successful or useful campaign is to demonstrate systematic patterns that this isn't just one time that the pig was hit that this is Mm -hmm. happening regularly at this abattoir that this isn't one particular um fact uh battery cage where the bird's uh claw is uh, wrapped around the metal and they can't reach for food this is something that regularly happens when birds have to live their lives on slated bits of metal And if you have to surrender whatever images you have that quickly, it's going to be more difficult to establish that pattern of behaviour. And then the other thing, sorry. No, no, so I was going to say, so that that works then to protect the the industry. The, The... Instead of locking up the advocates for a longer period of time, they're kind of just crippling what their movements could be or the efficacy of... Because it has been working so far, right, these types of strategies of showing prolonged, sustained abuse. I think so. I really do think that mm. the only way to build a a successful campaign, and certainly the media, you know, I mean, if you can get a, a, an issue up on a credible um, current affairs program, that's hugely beneficial to your cause. But, you know, 60 minutes programs such as that aren't, ru- aren't running um 20 minute segments on one person doing one thing that was unpleasant to one animal Mm. they are are interested in systematic problems and I think systematic problems also go to the heart of need for legislative change and that is um you know not in the best interest of industry so um yeah so (sighs) I was just thinking now when you were speaking about media and media exposure because it made me think a bit the one of the ag gag laws in the u s was changed I, I don't know what the exact name was, but at some point the language turned to calling uh, in essence animal rights activists terrorists and mm. I know that one of the defining features of terrorism is the use and manipulation of media uh, it's the more public it is the better it is is that something that's been used to justify the movements of animal rights activists as being terrorists so in Australia, my... I mean, I'm not saying I think they are terrorists. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> Just no, because no, that's. Yeah, no, you're right. You're absolutely right. I mean, one of the first laws in America was the Animal Activist Terrorism Act or something like that. So mm-hmm. it was very explicit. My sense is that that, like, that vocabulary has been rolled back in the US quite a bit. And I, I don't feel as though it is being used as prominently in Australia so it is a very you know it's a very hyperbolic way of describing animal activists and I'm not really aware of it I think there are some perhaps 
farming interests who would be quite comfortable with that vocabulary, but it's not really entered mainstream um, discussion. I think bio, bio, um, kind of one of the kind of uses of language that I think has been quite useful for um, animal agricultural interests has been around biosecurity and so Mm -hmm. the concept that you're disrupting the animals, you're bringing, um, you know, disease and and illness or whatever into these factory farms. Now, of course, from an animal activist perspective, they say, well, these are the most filthy places you could possibly go. How could you think that we're involved? But now a lot of activists have started wearing biohazard suits and making sure they're completely clean and to to try and, um, you know, to get ahead of that kind of criticism. Okay. Yeah, because it seems, I know that now in Ontario, ag-gag laws were just recently in December, I think both in Ontario and in Alberta, they were they were rolled or they're in discussion and about to be rolled out. So it's just interesting to see how these additional pressures and protections of animal agriculture are happening. And it makes me wonder, is the industry running scared? You know, is there a reason why Australia is now taking on the laws, Canada is taking on the laws? Uh, is is this a sign that these industries and their power are waning or is that too hopeful of you? I think that it is, I think we can see it in a couple of different ways. I think what it says is something around the effectiveness of animal advocates. So I think in the absence of any of this uh, trespass work, any of the publicity work, if the community were were unresponsive to this work of the animal advocates, there would be no need to create a gag law. So Mm -hmm. creating legislation, the lobbying and all the effort that goes into that is considerable and you don't create laws in response to problems that don't exist. So if the law is created, there's either a real or perceived problem. So I think one could say that animal advocates have had some effect, but mm-hmm. I do still think that the fact that then animal the animal industrial complex is capable of responding with such effective laws, you know, a whole suite of laws that are... Um, a, kind of irrational to the extent that already trespass is illegal, we know that, but they've kind of, yeah, doubled down, made it double illegal. The fact that they can get those laws up and running speaks to their considerable power. That, yeah. And that they've, you know, so the animal activists played their hand, uh, the animal industrial complex has responded with their hand, and their hand is a lot more powerful, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's an incredible observation um, when you start to think of it as a suite of laws and uh, the amount of lobbying that must go on, political lobbying to get these these passed. Oh, yeah. uh, early on in the, the interview, you mentioned something around visibility. And I think visibility it came up in your, your book, uh, Equality, Animals, Equality and Democracy. You spoke a fair bit about visibility and the relationship, I think, between uh, animal rights or animal welfare and visibility now obviously ag gag laws are designed to protect uh, or, or to refuse visibility they're, they're designed to make things as opaque as possible um do you want to maybe tell us a little bit about i think some of the tensions between public and private when thinking about visibility yeah well what, what i what i wanted to do in my book Animals Equality and Democracy which actually started as my PhD which had a much longer and more boring title was I wanted to try and understand inconsistency in animal welfare lawmaking and at the point I entered the debate the I think dominant thinking was yes animal welfare laws are deeply inconsistent and how do we account for those inconsistencies And the suggestion was that we look to economics. So because we can make money by harming some types of animals, but we can't make money from harming other types of animals, we end up with these inconsistent laws. And to get to the bottom of it, you just need to think about the economics of the situation. And my view is that that is a very important 
observation and it certainly does tell us a great deal about why we've ended up with this animal protection landscape that we live in. But Hmm. when we compare animal welfare laws even between animals that are economically productive, we still see significant variation. And so my view as a public policy scholar is that we cannot explain all these nuances just because of economics. There's more going on. And my hypothesis and my view is that that more is mm-hmm. about the public, um, the public kind of the democratic intervention. So we do live in a demo- liberal democracy. We do curtail activities even if they are profitable if they go against the kind of values that we hold. So, for example, we don't allow dog fights to occur even though they could be very profitable People, some people pay a lot of money to watch dogs fighting. There could be a lot of legal gambling around it. But still we say no, that's not the kind of people, that's not the kind of society we want to live in. Mm-hmm. It's not acceptable. We're going to prohibit it. So what I wanted to do in the book was to look at a whole range of different laws and see whether I can identify a relationship between the community knowing something about how animals live and die and perhaps the laws better protecting the animals. And what I found was that I really do think that for for an animal, being known, being seen, is an advantage from an animal welfare policy-making perspective. Even if you are economically productive, even if people can make money out of harming you, I think you're less likely to be lawfully harmed if you are visible to the community. And you, you gave, I think, what was a really powerful example where you spoke about coal, coal ponies, I think, only receiving the same welfare protections as uh, horses, urban horses, something like 80 years later. So urban horses, because people saw horses in Victorian England all the time, uh, it became something that disrupted their sensibilities and protections were eventually put in place. But these other ponies that were invisible were not afforded the same protections. Uh, do you see that kind of? So I, I'm, I'm guessing that kind of logic also works here with with animal agriculture, that we might be protecting the dogs in our gardens, but not necessarily the chickens on our plates, because we see the one as a living animal in our spaces, but the other we we it's kind of invisible to our lives. Mm. Absolutely. And I think um, we can even take that a little bit further and we could say that we protect the chickens in our backyards much better than we protect the chickens in our um, factory farms. So you simply cannot have birds, you know, you can't have a couple of birds in your backyard as kind of companion animals and then house them in the same conditions that you can do lawfully in um, factory farms. And indeed, you can't treat your dog at home in the same way you could treat a dog in a research laboratory. So even Mm -hmm. within the same species, I think visibility does influence things. And I, to me, it just, I, you know, it, seems to make perfect sense there you know and that we can find a lot of examples in other areas of policy where it seems to suit the powers that be that we can't see what's going on yeah it's it's uh so where, where do we go from here i guess that's that's the the next the next question before before i give you an opportunity to read your quote what do we do from here? How how do citizens of the world and of their respective countries resist these laws? Yes, so indeed. Well, there are some extremely brave people out there who are continuing to resist even in the face of ag-gag laws. And I have to say, so long as their work is non-violent and so long as it is uh, aimed at gathering information that is then shared and indeed focused on change, I support them. I tip my hat to them. I am someone who, as a general principle, really likes living in a society that has laws. I like having a police force. I like having those laws protected. 
as a general principle, I think private property works really well. I don't want to live in a world where people can just enter my apartment whenever they want without me having any recourse. So I do actually Mm -hmm. really like law and order, but I think that there are some laws that are very deeply morally problematic and I think that the way in which we treat animals is problematic and I do really think that allowing people to see how they're being treated is one of the things that can perhaps assist in making the world a better place for them. So anyone who does resist, even in the face of heavy fines and whatever else, I tip my hat to them. At the same time, activists are finding new ways to try and um, broach these topics and and uh, and do their work. And uh, I keep threatening to write, you know, an academic article about this, and then I get sidetracked with <laughs> podcasts and teaching and paperwork and all the rest of it. But I think one of the interesting developments for me as a political scientists interested in animals and change, I think the SAFE movement is one of the really interesting developments. And what the SAFE folk are doing is they are holding vigils, they are bearing witness, but they're doing so on public land. And I think for them, the kind of images that they're capturing from the side of the road where you can just see the pig in the back of the truck going to slaughter, Mm. I think that perhaps there is enough known about what's problematic about um, the slaughtering process, let alone the fact that the animal is dying and what it's like living in a south store, that that work that they're doing I think is still very effective. Now, of course, the powers that be could, of course, make it illegal to you know, stand on sides of roads with cameras, you know, when trucks are going by or whatever else. So there are ways that that, even that activity could be curtailed. But for the moment, I think what they're doing is overwhelmingly lawful and it is quite effective. So I don't see animal activists deciding that, oh, well, it's all a bit tricky, we're not going to worry about it. I think that... The momentum for change is pretty uh, pretty significant. That said, of course, vast numbers of animals are, are being killed and, uh, you know, animal agriculture, of course, is becoming much more prominent in Asia where often there aren't the kinds of animal welfare laws that have developed very slowly and, you know, uh, in my view, inadequate, but which Western countries have. So... The landscape is shifting and it's complicated and it's still, you know, it's still a terrible life for a lot of animal purpose bred ag- agricultural animals and I don't know if that's going to change, but I, I ho- I'm i hopeful that the resistance is, is going to continue and it's going to find ways to, to um, bring awareness. And what about folks that are perhaps... Um you know, maybe are afraid to to even test those laws to trespass. Uh, I had two two thoughts while you were talking there. One about you know, are, are there campaigns where people can write to their MPs or to to have you know to speak on behalf of of free speech or free movement uh, on behalf of those uh, activists or with those activists? And secondly, maybe the cynic in me was thinking. So we know uh, most people know what goes on, like you rightfully said, in a in a factory farm, uh, and yet many people do not change their behaviour. Many people want to only maybe send a letter and not become an activist, or want to eat their beef steak at the end of the day. And yeah, it's you, you ended on such a hopeful note, and I'm like, dob dob dob. Because as as much as there's been really great work that's been happening, has the change for all of these billions of animals, it's not happening fast enough. And oftentimes, you know, I have to wonder, there's visibility, there's knowledge, but there's also cognitive dissonance. There's, there's this incredible ability to see something and not see it at exactly the same time. Yeah, Absolutely. Look, I agree. I mean, so 
you know, again, some of my uh, critics and in inverted commas, my academic colleagues have pointed out to me in response to my work that, you know, animal activists has been raising this visibility of animals for many decades and yet the laws are still as they are and yada, yada. And I do, I do accept that I don't think invisibility is the answer, but I do mm. also accept that visibility in the way that I'm kind of suggesting it might occur um, is, you know, it's imperfect. I do, one of the things that I say in animal, you know, one of the conclusions I reach in animals equality and democracy, which I know is entirely theoretical, so I'm not proposing that this, we're going to see this um, being debated in on the floor of parliament anytime soon, but one of the, the theoretical, one of the solutions I propose is that we say, okay, we're going to embrace um, equality or equity when we come to animal welfare lawmaking. And we're going to say whatever applies to one animal should apply to the other. And mm -hmm. then what we're going to do is find ourselves in a situation where we really have to decide, do we want to protect all animals or do we want to be allowed to harm all animals? And what I say is that as soon as those laws are in, evoke, these equitable laws, I'm going to build a massive battery hen cage in my front yard and every single person who walks past my house is going to have to look every single day at birds living in battery cages and then we'll find out whether it's okay or not. Because knowing mm -hmm. that there is a problem but having it very far away from you makes a big difference. Now, this is oh, yeah. where we've landed with animal agriculture. It's not something that it's within my power or any of our powers to, to change. This is a situation. But I do think if we could actually see what impact we were having on the world more clearly, we would, be, we would take greater action. But we can't. Mm. We can't do that. So we have to try to do the next best thing. And this isn't just animal agriculture. I mean, people who are campaigning on climate change, people who are doing work around the use of um, child labour in Asia, in, you know, fabric industries, that kind of thing. I mean, it's very hard. Who, who among us would want to harm a small child, yet who among us hasn't bought a piece of clothing that probably did harm a small child? Mm. So it's very, very tricky and, uh, you know, animal animal welfare is just one field where we're faced with this very sizable dilemma. Yeah, and they're like you mentioned earlier, there are vested interests in making these practices and these processes as invisible as possible. There's a reason ag-gag laws are there because there is a power to visibility. Um, there is. Uh, I agree with you. Seeing something right in front of you versus on a screen is something quite different. Um, we've been talking, if you can believe it, for almost an hour already. Um, before we close, I wanted to see if you've got potentially a quote or someone who you would like to read. It could be your own work or someone else's work to maybe, I don't know, to round things up or to give a tip of the hat to. Yes, look, uh, when I ha uh, had the invitation to choose a quote, I was um first of all terror struck horror struck I thought how am I possibly <laughs> going to do this but I know anyone who's listened to my podcast will know that I ask these very difficult questions of my guests <laughs> and I realize that you know now I'm just getting a serve of my own medicine um but I also uh of course this is being recorded in a time of you know coronavirus and I've been working from home for the past six weeks. Our library's shut and all my books are in my office. And so I was talking oh. to um, some of my colleagues. I was talking to um, Dinesh Wadiwal, who quite a few listeners I'm sure will know. He's an animal mm -hmm. study scholar and he's, you know, Sydney-based and he's a friend of mine. And he said, why don't you go back to your PhD? You must have quoted so many hundreds of people in your PhD that <laughs> mattered to you. Why don't you go back and see what's in there that that you, that would resonate with you? And I thought, gee, that's a brilliant idea. I mean, he also, I was also speaking to John Hadley, who's another animal studies scholar, another Sydney-based person, another friend of mine. He said, 
why don't you kind of, you know, do, you know, he mentioned a few names, but I just couldn't choose. There are just too many people and I don't want to single anyone out. So I did exactly as Dinesh suggested. I went back to my PhD and I had a look through and this is actually um, not an animal studies scholar, but rather a, an author who has been really, really, I think, a great contributor to thinking about um, animal issues, and that's Cassia, the South African author. Now, mm-hmm. you can probably say his name a whole lot better than I can. Cassia, oh, you were you were very close. I wasn't actually. too bad. No, yeah. that was. F- Probably half of South Africa is also rolling their eyes at me. My <laughs> accent is so butch. <laughs> but you, you sound <laughs> well, Kusia lives in Australia. He lives in South Australia, so he's probably used to his his uh, name being butchered. And but this is a <laughs> quote from the lives of animals, and I I think it kind of basically sums up the puzzle that's in my head that I'm still writing about all these years later and I think probably I'm going to write about for the rest of my academic life Mm -hmm. yeah so I was taken on a drive around Waltham this morning it seems a pleasant enough town I see no horrors no drug testing laboratories no factory farms no abattoirs yet I'm sure they are here they must be they simply do not advertise themselves They are all around us as I speak, only we do not, in a certain sense, know about them. And that's my quote. Wow. I love the I love the geography of that because I could almost imagine myself driving and I could see the green grass and I could because it's quite pleasant. Um but then at the same time, when he said advertising, I was imagining big billboards with with hamburgers and cartons of milk. It's really powerful. You said that's Kutsia from The Lives of Animals? The Lives of Animals from the 1999 version. It's a page 119. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm but it is, a, it is a very beautiful book. I actually prefer The Lives of Animals to Elizabeth Costello. I mean, I mm-hmm. love Disgrace. I really do like a lot of his work a lot. And I think, you know, storytelling about animals is very powerful. And I think he's the master. I mean, he's a Nobel Prize winner. But I do really like the lives of animals. And if you want an introduction to the debates on animal issues, you know, I, I, I think you can do a lot worse than reading the lives of animals. Well, that's a fantastic suggestion, and I'll make sure a link to it is up in the description of the podcast. Uh, For now, I want to say thank you so much for being patient with my technical difficulties at the beginning of the episode. I know, I understand. (laughs) I understand completely. And uh, for for giving me so much of your time and your thoughts and uh, for doing the work you do. Thank you for, for joining us today. My pleasure, and thank you so much for doing this podcast. A big thank you to Siobhan for joining me for this episode. Uh, Another thank you goes to Gordon Clark for doing the bed music, Jeremy John for the logo, and a huge thank you to Animals, Philosophy, Politics, Law and Ethics, Apple, for sponsoring this podcast. Next time, I'll be speaking to Saskia Stuckey about the idea of animal warfare law. It's an interesting, fascinating episode, and I hope you will join me then too. This is The Animal Tone with me, Claudia Hertzenfelder. Hi. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com. Hi.